Well, Light Church, Happy New Year. Um, I love this time of the year. I feel like it's the time that you always dream big. You look at you know, your health plan, you're like, I gotta do this, and this is how I'm gonna get on track to where I wanna be. Or um, you look at things in your life, you're like, I'm gonna cut this, I'm gonna minimize my entire closet. Like, at least it's just me. I love this season. I think of everything that I want to do, whoever I wanna become, and I just start going for it. I write down things in my journal, all of that. But as I was just praying about today, as I was praying about just this new year and where we want to go as a church, um, just the last two years that we've really gone through, 2020, 2021, and in 2022, I just felt this impression that it's, it's actually, it's so easy to fall into this idea of like, let's just do more. But I really felt like the Spirit was just telling me our doing has to come from our being. And so as we start off 2022, I actually just want to start off with this idea of like, let's just be with Jesus. And I don't want to dive fully into it because we've talked a lot about this in the past, but, but if you were a disciple of any rabbi in the first century, you always wanted to hear the coveted words, follow me. And Jesus walks around and he says to these fishermen, these people who dropped out of school because they weren't the elite in their class, they never heard those words. And Jesus walked around and he said, follow me. You, hey, Peter, follow me. Andrew, follow me. Zebedee, you know, and he, 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 he calls all of them to follow him. And what that meant was three things. It meant you will be with me, you will become like me, and you will do the things that I do. That's what it meant to be a follower of a rabbi in the first century. And so when Jesus tells us to follow him, he's calling us into those same things. And so what I want to hone in on at the beginning of this year, 2022, is not, let's just do the things that Jesus did. That will come, and that is absolutely a part of who we are as followers of Jesus. But those all follow the, the first one, which is be with Jesus. And I love, you know, I think sometimes we jump into the new year, we're like, let's do all these things, but we forget that we just celebrated Christmas. And in celebrating Christmas, it, it's, it's this idea that it's God with us. Emmanuel, Jesus came into just the dirt and in everything of our world. He came with us and he was determining that he would never be God without us. That's what Christmas was all about. And so as we look at the beginning of this year, how do we dive into that reality? God is with us. Really, how do we walk it out with him? So I think the question is, where are you? Where are you? As we start off this year, just doing an inventory, where are you? are you? Not sitting on your couch or, or watching this on a mobile device, but, but where are you? Where's your soul at? How, how are you entering into 2022? Are you feeling bumped and bruised? Are you feeling just exhausted? Are you walking in with zeal zealousness? Are you excited? Are you feeling good? I mean, where are you on the spectrum of it all? And the reason why I wanted to start off with the follow me is we're going to get there at the end, but, but in Luke 9, Jesus says this, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever, now, um, not just the fact that, you know, someone could be Jesus' disciples, but it was the whoever. He, he had an open invite to anybody. And what he was saying is that I see in you the potential to be like me. Anybody. Didn't matter what socioeconomic status you were. Didn't matter um, what nationality you were. Didn't matter what gender you were. You could be a follower of Jesus. And when, when a rabbi said that to you, he said, I see in you the potential to be like me, and I'm calling you to be with me. And so where are you at? Are you walking with Jesus? And, and, and if not, that's okay. But the question is, where are you at? Because um, there is always a light at home waiting for us that's always ready for us to find our way home. But the question is, where are you? Because you can't find your way home if you don't know where you're at. You know, it made me think about, I think it was about two years ago to the day, and we were grabbing a mattress from, uh, from my wife's mom's house and uh, she lives in Tahoe and so we got a U-Haul, well we went to this place called, we got budget truck and really we just needed a bed, like it's always, it was just a king size bed and so we had like, we went there and all they had was the biggest truck and like the steering wheel was like sideways to go straight, the alignment was just fully off and here I am driving through Tahoe with this massive truck. So anyways, we start cruising down home and we get down the mountain and now we're all like in San Francisco area and I get lost and my phone dies. Trish is in a whole nother car, and next thing I know, I'm like driving towards Arizona. I'm like, I don't even know where I'm at. And I couldn't call my wife because my phone was dead. I had my watch though, and so I called her on my watch, and I'm like, hey, I have no idea where I am. And she's like, she's like, we'll just come back to the five freeway. I'm like, I don't know where I am. Like, I can't find the five freeway. And then my watch died, 
And I'm in the middle of all these orange trees because I got off the road. There's windmills, it was blasting wind. And I'm in this massive truck with like the steering is off and I was like, I was lost. I had no idea where I was going. And I had no way of finding a way back home. I mean, eventually I was able to go back to the freeway. I found the way back home. But, but if you don't know where you are, you can't find your way home. See, God is the creator of all of reality. And if we're living in unreality, we can't find our way from there. He's asking us, where are we? And so this is a good time for us just to take inventory at the beginning of the year of where am I at in reality? Where am I? See, Genesis 3, which is just the famous story um, of the garden and when, when the fall happened, God is going to Adam and Eve. And it said that he created the serpent. It's craftier than any other creation. And, and if you know the story, the, the, the serpent went to Adam and Eve and then starts deceiving them and says, no, 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 that tree, you can eat of that and beca- you can become like God. And then it says this in verse six, it says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together. They made coverings for themselves. So their first thing was let's hide. Let's cover ourselves. Let's let's hide from this thing that we did because we felt shame. And then verse eight, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden of the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. He said, where are you? Where are you? I'm going to be taking you guys, um, I'm going to be kind of doing a teaching, but we're also going to go through a little bit of a prayer exercise. And so right now, I actually want to invite you would, you, would you close your eyes, wherever you're at? And I want to invite just God to, to help you find where you are. Again, you can't find your way home if you don't know where you are. We can't be walking in unreality. We have to just say, this is where I'm at. And so if you don't mind closing your eyes, and just God, would you, in these next um, few seconds, would you help us just to find where we are with this last year feeling just a bunch of bumps and bruises and you know maybe there's fear around um, our future there's fear around the past maybe there's just struggles in relationship God maybe for some of us we're actually excited we're, we're pumped about this new year and we just bring that to you God and so would you help whoever is on the other side of this screen realize where they are and just take a couple of moments and just ask the Lord Where are you at? And you can always pause if you would need a little bit more time, but I think what we realize is that they were they were hiding. And um, they they sowed fig leaves of their own demise, their own protection. This is what we do, right? When we feel shame, when we feel fear when we feel let down, when we feel vulnerability, we, we, we put walls up. We try to protect ourselves. We kind of keep people or things at arm's length. And, and naturally what that does is that pushes us not just away from, from God. It pushes us away from others and it also pushes us away from ourselves. Because if you notice right there, they hid from God. Then there was broken relationship between each other. But then the story continues and Adam and Eve, they start blaming each other. And once you're blaming, you can blame someone else. But the reality is, is if you did something wrong, you're still to blame. And so when they're blaming someone else, they're not living in reality. So there's this lostness of they don't know where they are. And so we need to start there. Where are you? And the invitation of God is always, would you come out of hiding? Wherever you are, God wants to meet you. But then naturally the question that comes up is, well, then who's God? <laughs> if, if, if now this is where I'm at, how do I come out of hiding? How do I know it's safe enough for me to come out of hiding? Who is God? And you could look throughout the Bible. The entire Bible is just a library of books that all reveal who God is. So you could look anywhere. You could look at the stories, um, or you could do your Lecto Divinas, and you could look at a number of stories where, where Jesus says, that I am, you know, he says, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. You could look at any of those. You could be drawn into a story of God leading Israel through the wilderness and the exile and say, man, God, you are powerful. You are a God. You are present. You could look at any of the the stories of Jesus healing and just look at how Jesus interacts with people. I mean, you could look at any number of stories. So with that, I just get to kind of choose, which is great. Um, But there's a story in Luke 8, which just has been striking for me. 
the story in Luke 8. And again, I'm going to read it. Um, and I just feel like this is the most, these are the most important words in this message just as we read scripture. But Luke 8, 22. It says, Jesus, he, he just had all of his fame. There's crowds all around him. And then he says, in 22, one day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go to the other side of the lake. Now pause. If you're a Jewish boy, you do not go to the other side of the lake. Because on their side was the Jewish side. But to go to the other side, that was Gentile territory. That was scary. That was creepy land because there was worship of other deities. I mean, that's not where any good Jewish boy goes. But they got in the boat and they set out. As they sailed, Jesus fell asleep and a squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke Jesus up saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked the disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but he had lived in the tombs. When he had saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, though he was um, chained hand and foot and kept on under guard. He had broken his chains and had um, been driven by the demon into solitary places. And Jesus asked him, what's your name? Legion, he replied. This is the demon actually speaking, the demons. Because many demons had gone into him, and they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs. He gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When they, uh, those tending the sheep saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Jesus dressed the man. This is beautiful. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had got out begged to go with him, but Jesus Sent him on his way. So he return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had gone for him. And then they get in the boat and they go back across the shore. This story is interesting for a, a couple reasons. One, again, if you're a Jewish boy, you do not want to go to the other side of the lake. And on the way to go to this place where they should not be going, they meet a storm. And it says that Jesus was asleep on a cushion, but it's not just a cushion, it's the cushion. Now, if you're familiar with, with you know, boats, um, you know that the cushion, the spot in the back, that's where the rudder is. Jesus was supposed to be steering the boat, and yet he's asleep. Apparently, he's just having a nice nap, and, and then there's a storm coming, and, and if you're steering, your goal is to go perpendicular with the waves so that you don't topple over, but they were just going sideways to the waves. And so when they woke him up, what you have to ask, what were they expecting Jesus to do? They weren't expecting him to stand up and stop the waves. They were expecting him to steer the boat, to just do his job, and then he just wakes up, and you have to use your imagination a little bit. Jesus wakes up and just you know, from a nap, wipes his eyes, gives a little bit of a yawn, looks out and just says, stop it. Shut up is pretty much what it says in the Greek. He talks to the wind and the waves like it's a child and it just stops. And in that moment, the disciples are more afraid than they were before because the question comes up, who's in our boat? Now, they grew up with history of knowing of incredible things. They grew up with this idea, Elijah, you know, calling down fire from heaven. Like, they're familiar with the fantastical, except they've never, never heard of anybody 
speaking to creation and lording over creation. Who is this that is in our boat? This is the first time that they ever experienced this. And so you can imagine the rest of the boat ride was probably a bit tense. They're like, I have no idea what's going on, but there's, there's someone in our boat that's more powerful than all of creation itself. And I mean, you got to give it up for these guys are on a mission trip. They're probably just so frightened out of their mind. They decide to go through the middle of the night into a storm. And then they show up on the shore, not only where they shouldn't be as good Jewish boys, but then there's a naked demon man running at them. And so they got this naked demon man running at them and, and they're just like, what is going on? And this person is yelling Jesus' name. They're probably like, Jesus, how does this guy know you? But if you notice, they were asking the question, who's in our boat? But who answers that question? It's the demons. The demon-possessed man says, Jesus, son of the most high God. So the demons outsmart. The demons know more than the disciples did. And then the story continues where Jesus heals this man. And so, so first you find out he is God over all creation. That he, he controls the wind and the waves. And then he comes and he heals the demon possessed man. He sends the demons off into the bacon. And then the bacon gets soggy and jumps into the, to the river. Which is funny because if the demons were smarter than the disciples, then the pigs were smarter than demons, which says something about the pigs being smarter than disciples. But it's just this whole odd scene that is honestly kind of comical. And if you just put your mind there and you start to realize, man, this would have been a trip. And so Jesus heals this man, not, not only showing that he's Lord over all creation, he's Lord over the spirits. Like he is powerful. So who is God? Who is Jesus? Jesus is powerful, but also notice this. After he went across through the storm to the other side of the lake, they didn't want him there anymore. So they told him to get in the boat and go back across the lake. He traversed the storm. He went to the other side of the lake. He fought demons all just for one man, for one person. And this one person probably had like, what, two hours with Jesus? And Jesus says, hey, you know, you go disciple the Gentiles. We often think that Paul was the first apostle to the Gentiles, but it's actually this demon-possessed man. He said, no, you know enough. You've got a story of healing. Go and share it. Like Jesus is just incredible. And, and he clothes the guy. I just noticed that about our God that he's not only the Lord over the, all of creation, he's not only the Lord of the spirits, he's also the one that chases after the one, that loves the one, that would go through the wind and the waves for the one because it was just for the demon-possessed man that he crossed this, this lake. Now, I think that that's also interesting that he would just go for the one because he talks about that. He says, I am the good shepherd. I leave the 99 to go after the one. And I think often we sentimentalize this passage and we say, oh man, Jesus is going to calm the storms of my life, you know, so he can just be in my boat and go where I want him to go. This is not what's happening at all. The reality is, is he was the one driving the boat. This is Jesus' boat. If Jesus is in the boat with you, if we say yes to following him, he's not getting into our boat going where we want to go. We're getting in the boat with him. He's calming the storm because the storm is in his way for who he wants to go after. And so this is just this beautiful picture that Jesus is, is so powerful. But I think this is also interesting because it's one thing to have a powerful God. But if this powerful God isn't loving, then that's a scary God. And he could be a really loving God, but if he's not powerful, then it's kind of pointless. He has no power. But this is a character of God that we see in this passage, that he is loving. He would go all the way across the lake for one. But he's also powerful. So I think with that, naturally, the question is, who am I? So first thing is, where are you? And then the second thing is, is, who is this God? And so I want to invite you guys to close your eyes one more time. And I want you just to imagine that scene. Imagine the story as Jesus is crossing this lake and through the storm. And where are you in the boat? What's, what's your scene? What, what are you feeling as you're experiencing crossing this boat with Jesus? What would be your initial reaction? Maybe you can even reflect on this last year and just be like, man, I felt in the storms. My reaction was, Jesus, would you do this? Or Jesus, I kind of don't want anything to do with you. Or imagine yourself on the shores as this man comes up and you're watching the scene of Jesus heal him and love him. What's, what are you experiencing? What, what's your view of God? 
So the first question is, where are you? And the second question is just, who's this God? And taking you through his practice, because this is what you can do on the daily. Just ask that question. Okay, God, today, right now, where am I? And then follow it up with, and God, who are you? I need to be reminded of who you are, because I need to know it's safe for me to come out of hiding. And if you need more time, again, you can pause. But I think the follow-up question after that, of after who is God, is, is naturally, who am I? Who am I? Where am I, God? Who are you? Then who am I? And obviously, you read scripture as we read in Genesis, but, but we are made in God's image. I think oftentimes we're hiding. And so there's this beautiful story um, in John 21. And I love this because it kind of goes back into the follow me that we talked about in the very beginning. But what I love about this is, is I think many of us are coming out of a year of disappointment. I think we're coming out of years of disappointment, right? Years of shame or fear. We're coming out of this place of just feeling beat up. We're feeling just like our self-worth is just depleted. We're feeling isolated and lonely. And then, um, so I think with that, we can resonate with, with Peter. So John 21. So Peter has just denied Jesus three times. And you can imagine, I mean, Peter's like a golden retriever. He was the guy that was like, Jesus, I would do anything. I would die for you. And then Jesus says, no, 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 I know that you think that, but you're going to deny me three times before the end of the night. And, and that happens. So you can imagine Peter, just that, that shame that he had of, of not only Jesus calling that out in him, but then it actually happening. And so um, what, it wasn't just the darkest night when he denied Jesus. I think that continued. Just the shame, the agony, the failure that he had continued, and it continues on to this point. 21, verse 1, afterward... Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus has already died. He's resurrected. He's appeared one time, but now they're, they're back fishing. It happened this way. Simon Peter Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out fishing, Simon Peter told them. And they said, well, we'll just go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Now pause. You can imagine, um, because what do we do when we feel like a failure? What do we do when we feel the pressures of life coming in? What do we do when we feel shame? We feel like we've let people down. Our self-worth is depleted. We feel isolated. Well, in Genesis 3, we saw they they, they sewed fig leaves around themselves. They were were hiding. They were self-protecting. And here, Peter goes back to the attachments that he has. He goes back to the one thing he's like, well, at least I'm good at this. So he goes back to his previous profession of fishing. But then you can even imagine that after an entire night of fishing, he didn't catch anything. Like how much of a bummer would that be if you're Peter and you're like, at least I can do this. At least I can do this. Like I thought that I was going to be good as a follower of Jesus. Jesus obviously was wrong when he called me to follow him. Like he just messed up. At least I can fish. And then he can't even fish. I mean, just the dark night of the soul that Peter must be going through. Verse four, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And you can imagine they're like, dude, stop it. Like we're fishermen. This is what we're good at. And and any fishermen know that if you don't catch it in the middle of the night, you're not going to catch it in the day. But when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciples whom Jesus, then the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, his favorite name for himself, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped out his outer garments around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water, because apparently he fished naked. The other disciples followed him in boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. You can imagine, like, Peter's trying to swim in his clothes, and they just reel past him like, idiot. And then it says this, when they landed, they saw a fire burning, coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back in the boat, dragged this net ashore. I want to pause right there. I didn't mention this before, but there's only two times that the fire of burning coals is ever mentioned in the entire Bible. In both those times, it's mentioned by John, and both those times it's mentioned with Peter. The first time was when Peter was denying Jesus, and it said he was around 
a burning fire of coals, and that's where he denied Jesus. And, and so you can imagine, I mean, there's a distinct smell with coal fires. And so as Peter smells this, as he walks up, you can imagine the, the shame that's just brought back up. I mean, memory is so tied to our senses, particularly smell. And Jesus is being intentional with this, and we know because of the conversation that follows. So I love this, that when Peter wants to isolate, he wants to step away. He wants to go back to the thing he's comfortable with. Jesus is like, no, 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 I want to take you back to that place of pain, that place of fear, that place of shame and isolation. I want to take you back there, not because I want to hurt you, but because I want to restore you. And then Jesus says in verse 12, come, have some breakfast. Fish sticks is on the menu. None of his disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took bread, and gave it to them, and did, say, did so with the fish. Now this is the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And then this is beautiful, verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me a second time? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He says, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because he had to ask him a third time. He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. And then he just continues on. He says, very truly, I tell you that when you were younger, you dressed yourself, you went where you wanted, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you're not to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter was to glorify him. Then he said, follow me, those words again. And then it continues where Jesus starts to tell Peter how he's going to die. And then Peter looks back at John and he says this in verse 21, Lord, what about him? Do you ever feel that when you look at someone else's gifting, you look at someone else and you're like, well, what about them? Like, why can't I be like them? Or how are they going to succeed in this area? I love Jesus' answer. He's like, rather than comparing, he says, if I want him to remain alive, alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. And that phrase is just stuck with me. You must follow me. You must follow me. So Peter got lost in what scholars would say is the false self, where he just started taking these things, and we do this all the time, we take identities, we, and when we feel shame and fear and we feel like letdowns, we take these things and we just try to glue them and tape them onto us and say, this is my identity, or we go back to our middle school selves, well, all of a sudden we're aware of everybody else and what they have and what we don't have, and so we start just trying to put on these identities and say, this is me, this is how I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to cover myself up with this. And this is why God is so gracious because he first says, where are you? I don't want you hiding. I don't want you covering yourself up with all these fake things. And then he says, I am a loving God. I am powerful over all creation and I will go after you. That's what he says. And then he, he reminds Peter of who he is. He says, Peter, you are my disciple. I love you. And I'm not only going to like just let you sit in your shame. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to meet you in that moment. I'm going to bring it back up so that I can heal that because he knows that if you can't go there, you can't go from there. And so God is being so gracious to Peter by meeting him in his place of pain. And I wonder if, if maybe that's what God wants to do in the beginning of this year. Maybe before we get into, oh, here's all the things I want to do. Here's like my six pack plan or here's the food plan that I'm going to follow. Maybe it's more of, God, here's where I'm at. And you call me to be with you, to become like you, and to do the things that you do. Would you help me just to be with you? Would you remind me of who I am in you? Because it, our doing needs to come from being. And so, Light Church, the, the thing for this morning is just, would we be with Jesus? Would we look at him looking at us and be reminded that we are his disciple that he loves, that he would cross the, the, the storm to come to us, to love us, to remind us of who we are, that he's going to meet us in that place of pain and he's going to speak worth and truth over us. And if you notice, um, after the demon-possessed man was healed, he says, go, and then you get to disciple. So he says, now you can do the things that I'm doing. And then with Peter, where he says, you know, do you love me? And he says, okay, well then go feed my sheep. If you read John 10, that's Jesus's job description. 
He says, I'm the good shepherd. I tend to the sheep. And so if someone fails, you don't give them a job. But not only that, you don't, if someone fails, you don't give them your job. But this is what he's doing. He's saying, no, 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 no. Don't count yourself out. I know you feel beat up. I know you feel broken and down. But you follow me, be with me, and become like me and do the things that I do. You get to be like me. And I wonder if anybody needs to hear that this morning, that, that Jesus looks at you, and I know this has been a hard year, and he's not calling you just to do a bunch of stuff. I actually really feel like he's actually just calling you, would you be with him? Would you be with him? So as I end, I just want to give a couple notes because I think it would be absurd if the creator of all things, who created everything so unique, would demand that we be with him all in the same exact way. And we've learned a lot of this with Enneagram. We're just different. Myers-Briggs, you know, you just look at people and we're, we're different. We're all built differently. And so um, I want to free you up because I know you can get, I can get into this place where it's like, okay, well, now I have to spend an hour in the morning, you know, with the Lord. I got to do this. I, 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 and you, we kind of create these regiments as if this is how it has to happen. But I want to free you up because there, there are ways that you might be designed to relate and be with God that's different than someone else. Right, where Peter was like, well, what about him? And you could be like, well, what about her? I mean, that person, when they pray, they just have like these incredibly vivid images and, and they're nuts, you know, like they're crazy. But I feel like maybe God wants to speak to you in a different way. Maybe he wants to be with you in a different way. There was a season in my life when, when I, um, which there were like upstream disciplines, I'll explain that in a second, but I was just doing silence and solitude. I was like dedicating myself to that. And it was really beneficial for me, but I was doing that so much. I was only doing this one discipline. I actually found myself getting more depressed, that that wasn't necessarily the best thing for me. What I really needed to do is I needed to go surfing, and I needed to spend time with the Lord on the surfboard. I needed to have good conversations with people, and I needed to spend time with the Lord in those conversations. We need to learn how to live in two places at once. While you're driving to work and your commute, while you're, you're feeding your kids, while you're with your wife or your husband, while you're doing your job, but also with Jesus. So it's just learning how to do those things at once. And so we have upstream and downstream disciplines. Upstream disciplines are the ones that are just more difficult. For I think everybody, it's fasting. You know, that's just an upstream discipline. For me, because I'm such a people person, upstream discipline would be silence and solitude. What it just means is, is if you're going up a stream, it's difficult. But they're very important for us because if you don't, exercise, if you don't go up the stream, then your muscles will atrophy. But then there are the downstream disciplines, is the ones that are much easier. For you, it could be worship music, could be prayer, could be reading scripture, that could be a downstream discipline. Those are ones that just come easier. And I think what we need to do, if we want to be with the Lord, is just balance it out. Don't simply just sit in the upstream disciplines, the difficult ones, the ones that are just killing you and draining you. Sprinkle in some of the downstream disciplines. But don't just do downstream disciplines because if you're only going downstream, you're not working your muscles, you're not actually growing and your muscles are going to atrophy your spiritual muscles. And so as you want to step into being with God, would you, remind her, would you, be, would you be reminded that God first says, where are you? He just wants you to identify, where are you at? God wants to speak to you and say, this is who I am. I'm safe. You can come out of hiding. You can be with me. And then he wants to speak to you about who you are. And so as you dive into 2022, would we take that model, even just as a prayer model, would we begin to put things, rhythms in our lives, upstream, downstream rhythms, so that we can be with Jesus and everything else will flow out of that. And so Light, would you guys um, step into this practice of being with Jesus? And I can't wait to see what 2022 brings. Love you guys. Grace and peace.